my booktube welcome to Jackie's Literary Corner. I am Jackie and I thought I would do another ta a tag video. So I'm doing the bar and bookcase book tag and I will post a link to the original creator of this tag um, when I upload this video. So this is basically a tag where he gets um, drinks, um, alcoholic beverages, and then you find a book to pair with that alcohol beverage like any other tag um okay so let's see I did struggle with this one but hopefully this one will come up better than the last tag I filmed where some of my answers I feel like were a little weak but um let's start with question number one old-fashioned which I've never had before in fact I don't actually drink that much I well, I actually only stick to um wine I have tried I have tried a mudslide. Um, that was the first drink I ever had, and I've had I have tried beer before. The only beer I actually like is cider. Um, but old fashioned historical fiction. And I picked one that I just reread recently, a few months ago, and that is the Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. And I think any book lover would love this book. This is basically um about it's set. Um, it's one of those books where it goes back and forth between the present and the past. So it is struggle fiction, um, but it also takes place in modern times. And, or, um, the modern times of when this book was actually published originally. So we have, in, um, we have our main character whose name is Margaret. Um, and she is an amateur biographer. And one day she um, receives a letter from this famous author who has written a collection of fairy, fairy tale stories that are very famous named Vida Winter and has been asked to come to her house and write an article. But she ends up finding out that she wants her to write her biography. And she tells her the story of her life and it is the first time that Vida has ever been 100% honest with the person. She has never told the truth about her life. She's always made it up. And we get um, Vita Winter's story, which is very interesting and very compelling. Um, it, like I said, it's a book lover's book. If you love reading, I think you would appreciate and enjoy this book. And it's beautifully written. And I just had a really, it gave me warm and fuzzy feelings. If a book could do that, you, you know, warm, give me warm and fuzzy feelings, then it's a good book. So, question number two. Sidecar, again, another one I've never had. Um, a book with a strong supporting character. Oh, well, I, I guess I read that wrong. I thought it was like a cast of characters, like an ensemble. Which my answer is referring to an ensemble cast of characters. Because originally I was going to say the book that uh, one of the... Um, well, actually, originally, I was going to say another one of my answers for an answer I was going to use for another question that I thought about another book that, that my answer has been compared to, um, but I decided to settle on the, the answer I'm going to give, which is If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. So this is um, often compared to The Secret History, and it's kind of the same idea of... Um, Someone gets murdered amongst a group of friends, and it's all about them dealing with that and the aftermath of it. And in, um, and in this case, you're dealing with a group of academics who are Shakespeare fans, and the secret history was Greek. But in this one, it's Shakespeare, and they have been placed in their, they play out the roles that they always been have been cast in in their whole lives. And our main character was supposedly accused of being the murderer, but he might not be, he might be more innocent than we realize. And he is basically telling the story about what really happened to their friend that they murdered, that they supposedly murdered. And, um, first of all, this whole plot is so interesting and so engaging. Like I said, it's very, if you like The Secret History, I think you might like this one. And it's not as long as The Secret History, so I think a lot of people would appreciate that. And if you're, like, a Shakespeare fan, um, I think you also would enjoy this because there's so many references to Shakespeare. Now, granted, 
I haven't read a lot of Shakespeare, I'm, but I am familiar, obviously, with Shakespeare, because I think most people who read are probably at least a little bit familiar with Shakespeare. Um, I wish I was more familiar with Shakespeare, um, but sadly I'm not. So I think all these characters are so interesting and so compelling, and there are so many interesting dynamics between these characters and our main character, um, Oliver. Our main character, Oliver. I was about to say his name is Richard, but Richard is the main character in The Secret of History. But there is a character named Richard in this book. Um, it's just, they're such fascinating people to read about. And you just, you know, I love reading stories about really messed up people. These people are very messed up. Um, and they got a lot of issues. I find that so fascinating to explore those kinds of people. You know, and I guess it's because I'm, I'm pretty high up on, you know, I guess because a lot of times I think we're drawn to characters that aren't like us. You know, I've had, you know, I'm not, as far as I can tell, I'm not a messed up person. I have a pretty healthy outlook on life and stuff like that. So it's always in, interesting to me to read about those kinds of characters. Now, they are. I know when I say they're a strong supporting group of characters, I don't mean supporting as in they support the main character because they're not very supportive. They have a very dysfunctional friend group. But they really, I think they really add to the story, add to who Oliver is and who he becomes. They, I mean, you know, because who you surround yourself with as far, you know, they influence who you are. So I think they're strong group of characters, but not necessarily in a positive way, but in a interesting, good story kind of way, if that makes sense. So also, it's written like a shape, it's written like a script, so I think that was really cool, but that's nothing to do with the question, so just a little side note. Okay, let's see, okay. Okay, um, next question number three is, Manhattan, a book set in New York. And I said I decided to go with the classic that I read a, few, a couple years ago, which I no longer have, and that is The Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. Um, obviously this is set in New York, and it's about a young girl, um, a young, I think she's, if I remember correctly, I think she's Jewish. And it's about her life growing up, and her relationship with her parents, and her brother, and um, I believe if I remember correctly, she does end up falling in love and getting, you know, as well. There's like a little tiny little love story, but that doesn't, that's not a major part of the story that comes like much later. Um, and also, I remember that her brother, her father was kind of unreliable and not the best dad. But it was just, it was really, again, warm, fuzzy feelings, even though it wasn't a happy story. It was kind of interesting to explore Manhattan a story about, although, it's not Manhattan, it's Brooklyn, so I guess this really doesn't count. Oh, damn it. Um, well, you know, I'm sticking with it, so, um, so technically it's not in Manhattan, it's in Brooklyn, but it's still kind of cool to explore New York during this, this time, that time period, the early 1900s, going in, um, I always love like looking at New York and that through that lens of historical New York. Like I'm currently rereading um, on ebook The Diviners because it's been so long since I read the first book and I somehow got a hold of the second actually I know how I got a hold of the second book. And it was kind of a surprise, but then, you know, I was like my mom saying, Oh now I gotta reread the first book and refresh my memory and I remember her telling me at the time to like look at you know, look up the book. You're like I think she don't want me to spend my money and buy a book that I've already read um but anyway it's also kind of the same idea it's set in the 19 that one's set in the, in the 1920s well this one like I said is early 1900s and I think it's just so cool to explore New York during that time in the, in the eclectic population of New York and the different groups of people especially during during that time the early days of New York but when like during the people when immigrants were coming into New York via Ellis Island, um, there was so much culture in New York at the time, whether it was Brooklyn or Manhattan. And I just thought that was very interesting. Now, like I said, I guess it technically, 
Um, well, actually, no, I guess it can count because it does say a book set in New York. Okay, so, um, anyway, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. Great classic. Okay, and next question number four, but Lenny Mary, a book that scared you, messed you up, and I don't have this book, and that is The Circle by David Eggers, um, which it was, uh, I don't know if it was a dystopian, I, I guess it wouldn't be a dystopian, but it is kind of science fiction-y, where this young woman gets a job at this company, this big high-tech company that's like, it's like Google combined with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, um, and all the different social media outlets combined into one giant thing, and she gets this job, May get, our main character May gets this job there, and it all of a sudden, and it's all about, like, how social media influences people and what things could become in the future. It's kind of crazy because it seemed nothing different from now, you know, where people were constantly needing, you know, your life was always on camera. Every little thing you did was on, you know, if someone didn't like something that you posted, then it was like, oh my god, what, what does that mean? I mean... Am I, do they not like me or something? And it was everything. And so, and May's whole life becomes about this company. And she even ruins her relationship with her boyfriend because of it. And because she's so determined, like, the company wants her to put her family and friends on camera. They want to, you know, put her her personal life on camera. And she's cool with it. But her boyfriend isn't so cool with neither her, her parents. And it's a very disturbing, you know, and it, what's the word that, um, it scared me because, I mean, I wouldn't say it entirely messed me up, but it did freak me out a little bit because it's not that, it's almost, it's not that different from today. And if we're not careful, we could become, you know, it could be dangerous putting your whole life online, which I'm saying that just as I'm filming a, a booktube video. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was scary because it's a lot closer to our reality. I mean, it's, you know, it's very close to the way things are now. Um, okay, so, Espresso Martini, which I did not know this existed. Some of these other ones I've heard of, like, um, mostly, probably due to, um, catching a few episodes of Sex in the City. Um, but Espresso Martini, a book that kept you reading into the night. And this one I had a hard time, because I have this weird thing where I don't like reading books and finishing them up when I'm in bed, because all of a sudden when I finish the book, I have this high, this excitement that I finish the book, and you know, I'm still thinking, I might still be thinking about the book, so I can't go back to sleep. Like, I have so, all this energy build up, so I don't like finishing books in bed um, right before I'm meant to go to sleep. Um, so... I picked a book that I was trying to get finished before I went to bed, and that and that was a book I started like a year ago, and that is Needful Things by Stephen King. Um, it's another one of his books set in a small town. Well, let's face it, most of his books are set in small towns, and this one is set in Castle Rock, Maine, where this town receives a store called Needful Things, run by this man, this creepy old dude named Leland Gaunt. And he will provide whatever you think you need, something that you desperately desire, desperately feel like you need. And there is the price he asks for is that he will request you to do a special little thing for him, like a little prank on someone. And slowly over time, all those pranks escalate until everything just turns into chaos and all this crazy shit happens in this town. Um, well, the, apparently that... Castle Rock has a lot of great shit happening in, the, in that town. But it was so good. Stephen King no, definitely knows how to write a story about a small town and all its dark edges and stuff like that. And he also makes you feel very sympathetic and relating to these people, even if you completely disagree with their way of thinking and their beliefs. You at least understand them and you recognize them. Maybe not in yourself, but in others. In other people that you know or you've seen. 
you just don't know how to weave this great tale of, you know, making you just nerve biting your nails for knowing what's gonna happen. You wanna just keep reading and um and gotten is such an intriguing antagonist because he seems charming on the surface, but you can tell there's a bit of a darkness and edge to him that is very dangerous. But you can't or at least the characters can't resist his charms and just he knows their deepest desires and their fears and it's just I just had to find out how were they gonna actually defeat Gaunt, you know, what his team was, what he was, or were they essentially screwed? <laughs> and I'm um, so and it's another one it's definitely well, obviously one of his drunkier books, which most of his books are pretty drunky, so I'm just glad I finished it finally. Okay, so question number six. Sazerac? Sazerac? I don't know if I'm saying the right book that left you disoriented. That one, I could not, um, oh, well, actually, I did come up with an answer, but it's, again, a weak answer, just, um, just like the last, um, the, um, last tag I filmed, some of my answers were just, I feel like they are bad answers. But the best thing to come up with, well, although, Another book that Medium Bird definitely answered could also apply to this, but I don't want to use the same book. Oh, wait, no. Oh, wait, no, never mind. I was not, uh, I'm sorry, that book was not for that question. I was actually for a different question. Um, okay, well, I, uh, so I take it back. I don't actually have an answer for this one. Sorry. Um, I just, I didn't really understand the question. I didn't know what they meant by leaving you disoriented. Um, because, you know, I don't know. I've never read a book where I felt disoriented or felt like, well, what did I, you know, what did I just read? Um, okay, so let's get to the one that, um, I'm going to use this for. Um, and maybe this is not the best answer, but it's the best answer I could come up, come up with. This is the weak answer that I have, but... The question is, a Long Island iced tea. I'm almost afraid to drink that. Um, if I ever want to, like, I almost want, I'm curious, but then listen, at the same time, I'm a little, I'm a little apprehensive to drink that. Um, a book that is doing too much. Bonus points if it works anyway. And I just picked Game of Thrones because there's a lot going on and sometimes I have trouble following and I can't, you know, this is one of those books where I can't really tell you everything that's going on. I mean, I can tell you the basic plot, which is these people are all these different, all these people are fighting for, to sit on the Iron Throne. And as I saw, always say, I don't know why would you want to sit on that chair? Um, and there's, everybody's picking sides. There's a war going, everyone's in the middle of a war. And they're also war in the only, and there's a supernatural threat of the, um, the ice zombies, and only the Night's Watch really understands what's going on, but everyone else is just worried about the stupid chair and who's gonna sit on the Iron Throne, which I guess that is important, technically. Um, and it's all about medieval politics of this world. So, but it's so much is going on, there's so many different characters, sometimes it's hard to follow, and there are characters that are only mentioned, like, once or twice. Like, Watching, I personally feel like, I know how people feel about the show now, and the last few seasons just were rushed, and they were not good, and a lot of people disagree with how it turned out for certain characters, like Daenerys. I know people were not happy about that, but, um, I think in the beginning, those first handful of seasons really helped to remind me what was going on in the plot of each book so far. Like, um, the, like, and who the characters were and everything. Like, I was able to follow the TV show better than the books. Although, I still obviously want to read the books, because I do have them. So, um, and I think it's, I would think people would want to read the books because the TV show sucked. Because <laughs> they would want to get the original creator, the original author's storyline, which will, which I think we should trust will be ten times better than the show, because he's the original creator. The writers were making, pulling out of their asses by the end of it because the, because Martin hadn't finished the book. I mean, and he is updating him. He has a blog where he updates. And 
you know, I think he we, he should be allowed to take his time, which I understand the frustration. It's been forever, and maybe it's easier for me because I haven't even, like, I'm still in the middle of re my reread of Clash of Kings. Um, but I say give George R. R. Martin a break. So, anyway. Um, but yeah, this, I feel like so much is going on in this book, and it's hard to follow this whole series, but... Like, I can understand why people that aren't fantasy readers would have a hard time with this. It's still, I still love it. It's still enjoying. It's just, it is, it is a bit much. Okay. Um, question number eight is Negroni? I think that's how you say it. I don't even, I never even heard of that one. A book with a love triangle and I just said Akamath. Um, that's the Sarah J. Mass book that every... Every fan, every girl, young book to her loves about you know the girl who gets um, taken by the fair, makes a deal with the fae, and ends up living with one of the fae. But in the second book, she um, there's another potential love interest, which that's there's so much more to it than that. But um, the little Freya um, being in a love triangle with um. I always forget his name, the the blonde, the king of the spring court. I cannot remember his name. Um, him and then Resand. That whole love triangle is, you know. I know, and I think like either I think it's a polarizing. It's because every you either love them or you hate them. <laughs> and I like I was one of those people who love that love triangle. And I wouldn't continue reading her books because I just kind of I've lost interest in her work. You know, it's not because I hate her now all of a sudden or, you know, it's just, I've just lost interest. I took forever before I picked up book five in the, um, um, Throne of Glass series. But yeah, I, I find that I really, I like that love triangle, so I don't, like a lot of people did. Okay, so, nine, a bay breeze book with a light. Chill, chill, heartwarming vibes, and I picked the Rosie Project, which I do not have either. Um, this is about a man who I'm pretty sure he's on the spectrum, and he is um, a very logical thing. You know, I think he's a scientist, and he decides that it's time for him to find a wife because he's lonely and needs companionship. So he makes a list of the perfect qualities for the perfect woman to be his wife. Um, and he goes on a series of dates with help from, um, either his brother or his sister. Um, and none of them go well until he meets the delightful Rosie. And she does not meet any of his criteria. She has almost, has, almost meets none of his requirements. But he's intrigued by her. He's very interested in her because she's a very different, very unique person. And it turns out that she is trying to find her biological father. And he is a, he's not just the sign, he's a geneticist, I believe. So she asked him to help her find him by looking at DNA and comparing her DNA to these three different guys who potentially become her father, could be her father. And it's a rom-com, so I'm sure you can guess what happens. It is. It was a cute one, and it's kind of nice to see this kind of representation in in a rom-com. Um, the other, another. It's also a series. I think it's a trilogy as of right now. I don't know if the author's going to write any. I don't know if the author if he's going to write any more books. But so far, it's a trilogy. Um. And the only other book where I've seen a love and a kind of person who might, I think, might be on the spectrum, although I don't know, I think she just has other, she might have other mental health issues, is Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Because when I read that, I was thinking she might be on the spectrum too, but it might be other things with her. Um, so it was kind of nice to see a story like that. And I think, and it's cute, it's a very sweet story, you know, I love those kind of relationships where... Two characters completely different and opposite in personality, and then they come together and they just somehow work. You know, of course, in the real world, who knows if they would actually work? Um, okay, ten, dark and stormy, a book that's dark, thrilling, and menacing. Bonus point if the setting match matches. And I said, 
um, the shining, um, by Steve, and then there's Stephen King read, and most people probably know about this either from the, from the book or from the Stanley Kubrick movie, um, this is basically, um, a story about the, um, Torrance family, and they are given, and, um, Jack, John Torrance, he is, he has a lot of problems, he's had a lot of problems, he, um, he got fired from his job because of those problems, he's like an alcoholic, he has anger management issues, um, and so he gets fired from his job, and his friend is like, okay, I'm gonna give you, well, I'm gonna help you out here and give you this job as a caretaker for the Overlook Hotel in Colorado, in the Colorado Rockies, um, and this hotel, they, him and his family, his wife and the young five-year-old son are going to take care of the hotel during the off-season. And Danny, his son, has a, she, he has a special gift, which he finds out is The Shining, which basically is, he can communicate, he can see things and communicate with the dead and see have visions and he's kind of, he's essentially a psychic. Um... And the overlook is full of a lot of ghosts. And these ghosts try to get inside his father's head so they can get to Danny. And Jack or John slowly goes crazy, goes mad. Um, and this was like, it's it's not dark and stormy, but it is dark. It's set during the winter time. And these, these this family of three people are isolated in this, in this hotel. And like I said, John or Jack is slowly going crazy, you know, and cabin fever, and it's just—it's very scary and it's so effort, very chilling and atmospheric, and just—it's one of his Stephen King's best, I think, one of his most popular works. Um, now, as far as the adaptation goes, from what I hear, because I've seen, I have watched at least once, but it was probably not the best time to watch it. And I was only half paying attention to it. Um, but the movie, from what I hear, is not a good adaptation. A lot of people's opinion uh, is it's not a good adaptation, but it's a good horror film on its own. It doesn't stay true to the book, which, yeah, adaptations do that a lot, but there are some that apparently do it more so than others, and a lot of fans don't like that. Which, yeah, there are some that I feel that way about, too, and there are some that I'm apprehensive about them adapting, but I'm always a big fan of seeing, I want to get an adaptation. I just pray and it's good, and people will be happy with it. Other people will be happy with it. But I like having adaptations so I can see everything. Sometimes people, because as much as I love to read, I like actually getting the visual. So, yes, this, you know, it's creepy, it's chilling, it's very dark and isolated, and it's during the wintertime, which makes it worse, and it's just, it's very good. Okay. And then next is question number, ele um, question number 11, martini, which is a classic, a classic drink. Um, I know that some, I think Carrie from Sex and the City drinks martinis. And I think a lot of, like, 60s, 50s set stories, you know, the husband will get a, mar a glass to martini when he comes home from work after a long day. Um, and it's, cr the um, recommendation is Crime and Punishment by Fedor Dojceski. This is my first Dojceski I've ever read. Um... This was so good, and it could also be right time, right time and place, because, you know, I did, I was surprised that I loved this as much as I did, but it was so interesting and compelling. It's basically about a student, a young man, that he's broke, and he's in debt, and needs money, so he comes up with the perfect crime to, um, and it's, when he finally commits the crime, it's all about his guilt and his fear of getting caught, his slow paranoia. That he's gonna get he's gonna get arrested because there is a police detective on the case trying to figure out who committed this crime. Um, and we also have a subplot of his sister having at least two, three eventually suitors who and two of them tried to blackmail his sister. It's all about him trying to protect his family, his sister and his mom. Um, it's just so 
such a compelling narrative. Now, I um, mean, yeah, Dostoevsky does philosophize a lot, and I think that's part of why a lot of people aren't, don't always love him in his work. But for some reason, this just this did it for me. This was so interesting, and it was so interesting to be inside our main character's head. Um, watch him slowly fall apart. Um, there is a bit of a side love story, but I'm not a big fan of love story because it was very insta lovey. I mean, it was sweet at times, you know, but it was just like, I didn't really care. I mean, I felt bad for her and everything, but I, at the end of the day, I just did not care. Um, I just care more about, okay, is he gonna, you know, is he gonna get caught? Is he gonna get away with it? You know, is what's gonna happen to him and what's gonna happen with his sister? You know, um, it's just, it's just such a great narrative and I definitely, it might not be for everyone and I, I do have struggle with these kinds of things where you recommend books, especially, you know, because everyone's tastes are different and not everybody's gonna love this. But I decided to pick this one because it was one of my favorites. And I did not want to, once again, pick Jane Eyre or Do the Great Gatsby. Although I'm close to picking, although this is close to being one of the ones that I've picked, that I've picked several times. Um, but yeah, this, this is so great. And I definitely, this is my recognition for Martini. Okay, so um, that was definitely went better than the last tag I filmed, which was the spring cleaning tag. Um, so if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, click subscribe if you haven't already, click the bell notification below if you want to know when I post new videos. Um, like I said, I'll post the link to the creator of this tag, and which I know I can find this time, I know I can find it because I found it before. Um, so I hope, um, I hope you are continuing to wear your mask. Wash your hands and sanitize as well. Stay six feet apart from people. We are now at, we are not unfortunately out of the woods yet, but hopefully we will be soon. And I hope you're enjoying your reading, and I will talk to you all later. All right, bye.